Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this midweek portion of this week's study. As we continue to look at this document, shall we ask our Heavenly Father to open our minds, guide our thoughts, and direct our conversation so that we might more clearly understand some of what's being presented here and what God would have us to understand. Shall we praise him and thank him in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, as we begin this day, we thank you for all of the blessings and all the guidance that you are providing in our lives. We thank you, Father, for these trials that you present before us. We know that this is for our good. We ask now, Father, as we open this document and as we compare your word line upon line, that you might help us to understand more clearly that which we need to know. Direct us now. Show us, Father, that which you would have us to understand. We need your spirit. We need your angels. We need you and your wisdom so that we might rightly divide the word of truth. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity. We praise you for all that you are doing, and thank you for the blessings that you are providing, now and always, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, the initial statement on this page, we are clearly informed that the papacy and, ad and atheism are both engaged directly in a war against the Bible. And here we have three quotes from different sections of the Great Controversy. Atheism, atheism in particular was to arise to make open avowed war upon the word of God. Great Controversy 269.1. It should be noted here that she does not say that atheism was to arise to make open avowed war against the papacy. And again, the atheistical power that ruled in France during the revolution and the reign of terror did wage such a war against God and his holy word as the world had never witnessed. Great Controversy 273.2. It was these two powers working in combination that brought on the ruin of France. It was popery that had begun the work which atheism was completing. The policy of Rome had wrought out these conditions, social, political, and religious, that were hurrying France on to ruin. Great Controversy 276.4. Any thoughts about that at the moment? Okay. Well, so what we have here is, so first he's trying to say that from yesterday, that um, in Revelation 11, verse 7, uh, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit would be atheism, right? Now, we can say it's France, and France is an atheistic power, but the but we're having problems with this bottomless pit aspect. Right. We have in chapter 17 a beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. And if we were just going to follow the simple simple rules, right, we would say, well, in 11 verse 7, it talks about a beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. And then in chapter 17... It asks us, or tells us, I guess, the beast that, uh, where is it? The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. And so a person would argue, well, that is France, right? Okay. Right. I mean, that's how you would, you would have to do it. If you're just going to say that the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit is atheism, well, then, then you would have to say that's atheism, I guess, not necessarily France, right? In, in Revelation 17, verse 8. So you got Revelation 11, 7, and 17, verse, verse 8, that both talk about a beast that ascends of a bottomless pit. And the question is, are they the same beast or not, right? So, so he doesn't really, he doesn't really address this, this issue. Right. He's just focusing upon his idea about this being atheism. Now, as far as how he's reasoning here in this paragraph, doesn't really make much sense because uh, I'm not really even sure what he's trying to say. Maybe okay. like when he says it should not it should be noted here that she does not say that atheism was to arise to make open a vowed war against the papacy. 
but it's to make about war upon the word of God. But it doesn't mean then that the papacy and atheism are in concert, right? I mean, they both are opposed to God's word, but it doesn't mean that they're in agreement on everything, right? It does, and it doesn't mean they're not fighting against each other. Well, here's here's the other part of this. Yeah. The quote that he's using here from Great Controversy 276.4 is only part of the paragraph. Yeah. Now, it is a good direct quote that he's using here, but it's also the very early portion. Now, this paragraph continues. Writers, in referring to the horrors of the revolution, say that these excesses are to be charged upon the throne and the church. In strict justice, they are to be charged upon the church. Popery had poisoned the minds of kings against the Reformation as an enemy to the crown an element of discord that would be fatal to the peace and harmony of the nation. It was the genius of Rome that by this means inspired the direst cruelty and the most galling oppression which proceeded from the throne. So yes, there is a work that atheism had been completing because Rome had started a work to turn the minds of many from the true God. Right. So when we look at, at what, okay, so so we go back to the beginning of the Christian church. So we have Christians and you have uh, churches in all these different cities. Um, and then you have bishops and so forth. Now, of course, the Catholic church tries to say that it was the Catholic church existed then, but the Catholic church didn't, Right. You basically just had Christians, right? It's going to take time till we get what we call the Catholic Church. You, you would agree there? Yes. Yeah. So we have um, development that's, that's happening. It begins in the first century even, right? That is, we have different so-called Christian groups, Gnostics and so forth, especially in the second century, with varying ideas regarding what what Jesus said or how to understand Christianity. You know, different groups, some not believing that Jesus was bodily resurrected and so forth, right? So you have all of these different ideas floating around. And a lot of them are influenced by uh, pagan ideas, right? So these, these are going to affect uh, various Christians in various localities. There's going to be heresies, right? Heresies exist. Now, as you have uh, the papacy developing. The papacy is, in order to control everything, they're going to use the authority of the Roman bishop, right? Right. With, with the support of the state. That's how they're going to deal with these, these heretics. But it ends up being a system that that is corrupt. And And so what they do is they put tradition over the Bible. They suppress the word of God. They don't allow it in the common language. The average person can't get access to the scriptures. And so anything they know about God and, and the Bible that comes to them through their priests, right? That's basically right. what. So this sets a groundwork for what's going to happen in the French Revolution in lots of different ways. One is people don't know the word of God. Right. They're reacting to a apostate Christianity as if that does represent the true God. And but this work that has begun by popery is now going to be completed by atheism. Now, it doesn't mean that the papacy and atheism are in agreement. Right. That, that is, they're not working together. Correct. Right. You know, it's not like this is not the the. In the papacy's mind, in the Catholic mind, their goal is not to become atheists or to make the world atheistic. But in essence, what they have done to the word of God leads to atheism, right? It's not an intentional uh, part of their thinking. The papacy wants to control the world. That's their goal, which, which is not an atheistic goal, right? They don't want to be atheists so that they control the world. They use religion to control the world, not atheism. 
but it, it breeds atheism. So that's all that's being said here. But but he's trying to say that they're basically not at odds with each other just because, you know, they atheism ends up completing what pa uh, pa pa the papacy or popery had begun, right? That's sort of his argument. Well, it's it's almost like his argument is that the papacy and atheism are both fighting the Bible, both fighting the word of God. They are. Yeah. But from different aspects. Uh, well, definitely they're doing it from dis different aspects. But he's trying to argue they're not fighting each other. Correct. Which which I don't think is the case. Now, because part of what we're we're trying to deal with here is this the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. You have these different powers. Catholicism, the beast, false prophet, Protestantism, and then of course you have atheism or spiritualism or communism or whatever, all these types of religions and systems that uh, don't believe in the true God, right? That is, they reject the God of the Bible. Catholicism doesn't, and neither does uh, Protestantism. They profess to be believing the God of the Bible. The other groups don't. And, and so there's lots, lots of groups that we could put in that, that dragon power. You know, we could call it paganism. Uh, we could call it spiritualism. We could call it atheism, right? They're still the same thing in, in this context, right? They obviously have lots of differences between somebody being a spiritualist and somebody being an atheist as far as what they would state they believed. But they would all not believe in the God of the Bible. So, so that, that's how we define atheism uh, biblically. So, so when, you know, when he's trying to argue about this new power now as being atheism, that's where I'm still, we have to sort that out somehow. How do we deal with the, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit? Or the, right? So, how, how are we going to address that problem? Because it's something we, we, we've we never really discussed in any detail. Yesterday was the first time we sort of thought about it. Any ideas? I don't have a direct idea yet. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we can follow Miller's rules. We can look up every time we have uh, a beast ascending out of the bottomless pit. So the bottomless pit being uh, Abusos. Um, if we look that up, it it occurs in the New Testament, and that's one zero three seven is. Let me see what the, it. So the Greek number is twelve, but it comes from. Uh, oh no, never mind. Yeah. So the, yes, yeah, so the Greek number is twelve. It occurs nine times that word in the New Testament. In Revelation, it's used always in the sense of bottomless. In Luke 8.31, it just translated as deep, and that's when Jesus is talking to these demons, these devils, right? When he says his name is Legion, right? And they besought him that they would not command him to go out into the deep, which would be the abyss. And then in Romans 10, verse 7, who shall ascend into the deep? That is bring up Christ again from the dead. So, so the abyss there uh, refers obviously to, you know, basically the idea of what we would generally call hell, right? It's right. This, this this place where Satan dwells. Now, in Revelation, you're going to see it in nine verse one and two, nine verse eleven, uh, Revelation seventeen verse seven and eight. Uh, 20 verse 1 in Revelation 23 is what they say. Now, this is just uh, my King James concordance. And so when we look at, and I'm not sure why they don't show Revelation 11 verse 7. Now, do you, um, uh, I don't know here. Why don't they show this verse? It's the same number. It's the same word. So they don't show us in, in my uh King James Concordance on Esau. They don't show us 11 verse 7. 
but they give us Revelation 9, verse 1 and 2, dealing with Islam and Revelation 9, 11 with Islam. So is there something we have to rethink about, about this, just in what we look at? So we know Islam comes from the bottomless pit. They're going to have the Muhammad's going to have the key to the bottomless pit. In 9-11, it's going to say, you know, the same thing. And they, came, they had a king over him, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. That's going to be uh, Othman, right? Right, because these are locusts. They get a king. That's going to be Othman. Uh, we get the Ottoman Empire. Now, in Revelation 20, verse 1, and I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit. So one is you're going to see that Othman says he had, they had a king over him, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. So in Revelation 20, verse 1, when I saw the angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit, is that, you know, Othman, right? You understand what I'm saying, that we need to sort out what how this bottomless pit relates as a symbol to these different powers in Revelation 23, and they cast him into the bottomless pit that he should deceive the nations no more. Okay, so I would like to resolve this issue. Dwight, you got any thoughts on that? I don't any? have a correct thought yet. <laughs> Anybody have thoughts on this? How, how, do we, how do we deal with this bottomless pit and, and, and the beast that ascends from the bottomless pit? Because, I mean, if you just did a simple Miller's Rules and you looked at these verses... You would have the angel of the bottomless pit and the key of the bottomless pit connected with Islam. You would have this beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit connected with France, right? The, this, um, right? The beast. Now, are we going to say that just all satanic powers are connected through this symbol? That is, Islam is a satanic power. That is, it becomes, but then you have a beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, which definitely is the papacy. Or do you think we should we just leave this alone and leave it on this thread, just don't pull on it? I think we're going to have to pull on the thread one way or the other. Okay. Yeah, so, so we have this issue. We have this issue of atheism. And, and this is, his argument, though, it's not really a clear argument what he's trying to get at, because, you know, one is he's going to say that the false prophet is connected to spiritualism. Right. And yet right. We, we would connect spiritualism with atheism. Very correct. Um, because the nature of spiritualism is the rejection of the true God so that we have nature or whatever. You know, there's all different kinds of types of spiritualism. We put Hinduism in there as spiritualism, we put Buddhism as spiritualism. You know, some of these have quite different beliefs, but the main thing is the rejection of the true God and of God's law and the responsibility to God, right? So now obviously we know that Protestants, uh, will, you know, many will obviously reject God's law in the end, but it doesn't make them this a symbol, the symbol of spiritualism you wouldn't attach to the false prophet. So a symbol that we would attach to this? Yeah, so when we're, when we're dealing with this beast that comes out of the bottomless pit in 11 verse 7, is it the same beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit in 17 verse 8? Would we, just, we, just, would we argue that they have to be the same just because there's, there's a beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, the beast that descends out of, ascends out of the bottomless pit? Now, in 17, verse 8, he says, he shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And in 11, verse 7, uh, it's not that he shall ascend, but he ascendeth. Uh, so that was, what, 11, verse 7, right? And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them. And, and we understand this to be France. So how do we reconcile... France being the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit and the papacy also that it's going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. Does, so does that mean that, that there's something about the papacy in the future that it ascends out of the bottomless pit? Because initially it ascends um, out of the sea, 
right? The papacy comes up out of the sea. Right, because the papacy has to come up from among the peoples. That is the reference from coming up from the sea. Okay. Yeah, so so maybe what we would have to look at in Revelation 17 is, well, this is a new manifestation of satanic power. That is, so in trying to understand the beast that thou sawest was in and not was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. We've taken the position that that beast was the papacy, but maybe that beast is not the papacy. Maybe it's not the beast of Revelation 13. Maybe it's saying that uh, the scarlet colored beast is right. You understand what I'm saying? That, that there's yes. something in our thinking that we need to, we need to go over. So we see this woman. The woman is the Catholic Church. The beast is not, right? That she's riding in in chapter seventeen. Anybody else have thoughts on this? Nobody with thoughts about this. Stephen, do you have any thoughts? I think that we know from five thirty eight to seventeen ninety eight. Mm-hmm. Could you not say that the the woman was riding the beast then? She had the ten kingdoms. And then the papacy has that deadly wound. So it's not, in the sense, it's uh, United States comes in. Okay. So so, so in Revelation 17. So, you're in, a sense, so in a sense, she's, she's yeah. not riding any beast there, but she's still the woman. Okay. Well, well, she's, okay. So we have a symbol, right? We have these symbols in these different chapters. In, in Revelation 13, we're going to see the papacy symbolized by a seven-headed, ten-horned beast that that has the attributes of the beasts of, of Daniel 7, right? And we know that the ten horns there are going to represent the ten divisions of, of Rome, right? That's the position we've taken. The heads represent the successive uh, kingdoms, and with three of the heads all representing... I guess you would say four of the heads, always representing Rome, both pagan, papal, the United States and the UN. That's how we've dealt with the heads. Now, we, we've had all the beasts with those heads in the past, with the, the heads symbolizing those things. So what are you saying about in Revelation 17, that it's describing the same period of time? Or, or is this something that's descri- being described at the end of the world? Wouldn't it be describing the end of the book? The end of the world there? Right. Yeah, well, that's the position that I've taken, is that this is actually a different time, right? So you got, you know, you got pagan Rome, you have papal Rome. Obviously, papal Rome's the 1260. So in Revelation 17, we've, what, what we did is we said that this, that this is the kingdoms of the world at the end of time, and we don't see the woman as the beast itself, She's just riding the beast, right? She's committing fornication with the beast. And all the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So then John's going to be carried away into in the spirit into the wilderness. And there he's going to see, he sees the woman sit upon the scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Right. So it's going to describe the woman, how she's dressed, and that she's Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She's drunken with the wine of the saints. So so this is something. So the woman herself is the papacy, not just at the end of the world, but at all time, right? So that is that what you're saying, Stephen? She's not riding the beast technically until the end, this scarlet-colored beast. Well, I think she's riding the beast during the 1260. In a sense, well, that, that beast is, in a sense, that church-state relationship. Okay, yes, but this beast is a different beast. Yes, it's pointing to the time, really focusing more on the, the, the leading up to, anyway, the, the ten kings. Right, so it, it's leading up to the time uh, in the future, because... Now, it says, so he carried me away into the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon the 
scarlet colored beast. Now, when we deal with the wilderness, we take that as the 1260, right? Yeah. So, so the woman, I guess, is sitting on this scarlet colored beast, but it's still not the same beast as Revelation 13, right? That is the focus here is what's going to happen at the end of the world. So the woman does ride the beast. She commits fornication with the kingdoms of, of the earth through that whole period of time. But the beast of Revelation 13 is the papacy. In Revelation 17, the beast is not the papacy. The woman is. Okay. So then it says, um, the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. So he's going to explain this mystery, right? The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So, so the reason why I said this was the beast of Revelation 13 is because, but maybe that's not what it is. But, but, but the, the, the reason why I said it was is um, because it was and is not and shall ascend, and it was and is not and yet is. So we have in Revelation 13, one of the heads being wounded unto death, receives a deadly wound, right? But the deadly wound would be healed. Is there any other way that we could understand this? So, you know, I know we have an understanding of how we've seen this in the past, but is there some way in which we can, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So, so France that beast that represents France ascends out of the bottomless pit. The papacy ascended out of the earth. So what does it mean it ascends out of the bottomless pit? I mean, we know that's a satanic power. It's a out new of the sea. Out of the sea, you mean? Yeah. So did, what did I say? Out of the earth. Okay. Yeah. I meant sea. <laughs> my brain said sea. My mouth said earth. Because I was thinking about uh, the, the beast with the two horns comes out of the earth, right? And you have the beast with seven heads and ten horns coming out of the sea. So we can have Islam ascend out of the bottomless pit, right, as locusts. We can have France ascend out of the bottomless pit. And now we're going to have another beast ascend out of the bottomless pit. But they're not the same powers, right? No, they can't be the same powers. Right, okay. So... Now, is the bottomless pit, are we just going to ascribe to that atheism? Or is there something else that we dis we ascribe to the bottomless pit? Now, when, when it comes to Revelation chapter 11, the bottomless pit is not what gives it the symbol of atheism, right? What gives it the symbol of atheism in Revelation 11? What gives France the symbol? Where is the symbol that's atheism? Egypt. Yeah, Egypt, right? So so coming out of the bottomless pit doesn't mean that it's atheistic. It's the Egypt symbol that gives it atheism. And, of course, the Sodom symbol that gives it licentiousness. So that symbolizes the licentiousness. So, so when in Revelation 11, 7, and when they have shall finish their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. That has to be France, right? Just simply, right? That's the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. But that's not why it's atheistic. Because we, we would have to argue that uh, Islam was atheistic. But it is satanic. Okay, So, so we, we kind of get... Does it make it clear to people that you can have three different powers all ascend out of the bottomless pit? It doesn't mean they're the same power, and it doesn't mean they're atheistic. It just has to do with the satanic nature of it. Jeff, you have a comment? So Yeah, I could see that. Okay. So when he he's going to make this argument, I'm just going back to, you know, maybe I got so caught up in what, what was said here, but... When they finish their testimony, the beast, atheism, right? We just argued that that's France. The beast itself is France. Now, France is atheistic, 
but you wouldn't argue that it's atheism. It is, would that make sense? Or would we argue that it's atheism? No, I, I don't see it being able to be argued as being atheism. Okay. Now, France already existed before, though, but this is a new France, right? This is not the same France that existed before. It was a monarchy. So can we say France as a nation in, in, in this republicanism form, whatever we want to call it, but I don't know what you would call it, because France has been France as far as we're concerned all this time. But it's no longer a monarchy. It's now a republic. Maybe you could say atheistic France, but I don't even know if that's the best way to describe it. Because right? Stephen has made the point before, France already exists. So to say that this beast ascends out of the bottomless pit, going well, to make... Sodom, if it's Sodom and Egypt, Egypt is atheistic. Right. So we know it's atheistic, but, the, the, but coming out of the bottomless pit, this new manifestation of satanic power, right, which is how White describes it, right? That's how she describes it. Am I not, am, or am I getting something mixed up? Yeah, yeah I believe that's correct. Yeah, so it's in uh, Great Controversy 268.3. When they shall have finished, the, finished or are finishing their testimony, the period when the two witnesses were to prophesy clothed in sackcloth ended in 1798. And as they were approaching the termination of their work in obscurity, war was to be made upon them by the power represented as the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. In many of the nations of Europe, the powers that ruled in church and state had for centuries been controlled by Satan through the medium of the papacy. But here is brought to, new, uh, brought to view a new manifestation of satanic power. So when we have it, it had been Rome's policy under a profession of reverence for the Bible to keep it locked up in an unknown tongue and hidden away from the people. Under her rule, the witnesses prophesied clothed in sackcloth. But another power, the beast from the bottomless pit, was to arise to make open a vowed war upon the word of God. The great city in whose streets the witnesses are slain and where their bodies lie is spiritually Egypt. Of all the nations presented in Bible history, Egypt most boldly denied the existence of the living God and resisted his commands. Right. So, so we can see that that characteristic of um, and then it's spiritually Sodom, right? Corruption, and breaking God's law, right? So then she's going to talk about a little before the year 1798, some power of satanic origin and character would rise to make war upon the Bible. And in the land where the testimony of God's two witnesses should thus be silenced, uh, there would be manifest the atheism of the Pharaoh and the licentiousness of Sodom. So she's going to basically say, uh, France as a nation is the one that's going to speak against God. So, so this this beast has to be France, but France already exists. So, so it's a new manifestation of satanic power. It's it's France, but it's France in a different way form than it's ever had before. And and we looked at some some arguments that you know France is really the first nation in the way that we understand uh, nationalism today, even though nations existed. But France has this new idea of nation. So yeah. not only is this not the papacy, this is a new manifestation, a new manner of looking of atheism, right? Yeah, well, it's a new manifestation of satanic power. Now, it is atheistic. And it's also licentious. It has these two characteristics of Sodom and Egypt uh, attached to it. But the beast itself can't be atheism, right? Now, obviously, France is atheistic. But a beast needs to represent a kingdom, not an ideology. Right. That's, that's all I'm saying. But in order to understand that, the problem that we have is we have another beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. So we have Egypt. two beasts. What's that, Jeff? Yeah, I thought Egypt, Egypt was an ideology too, wasn't it? No, it's, it's a country. 
No, I mean Egypt, the the government, the yeah, structure. But it, yeah, but an ideology is an idea, like a belief system. And they still had their gods. Egypt yeah. still had their gods. Yeah, but they're not an ideology, right? Egypt is a nation. You got, you know, Egypt, Babylon's a nation, Greece is a nation. They have characteristics, right? Each of these nations has characteristics. France's okay. characteristic here is its atheism and its licentiousness. But France already existed. So we're going to say that this beast is going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. And we know that there's another beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. And we know also Islam ascends out of the bottomless pit. So, so it shows their satanic origin. But just because you ascend out of the bottomless pit does not make you atheistic. Right? It doesn't make you part of atheism. It doesn't make you part of spiritualism in that sense. Hopefully people understand what I'm struggling with. <laughs> well, before this, we didn't. I mean, at, at the time that this came into the view of the world, we had the Jacobins. Yeah, which Ellen White says were involved in the French Revolution. Right. But the Jacobins of that period became the communists of today. Right. So they're, they're, they're part of that same train of thinking i guess it, you know it it it's it develops right right you know the jacobins of course don't have the the term you know communism that doesn't exist yet right but the jacobins were a they were not a country no they were and they were a concept that was expanded so is it possible that this coming from the bottomless pit would be the Jacobins and the communists of today. Okay. So, I mean, one of the things we can say about, so the question is what characteristics are, are we going to, what, what are these symbols representing and what characteristics uh, will they apply when we have this beast that's going to ascend out of the bottomless pit? So we can say, well, atheistic France, it descend, it ascends out of the bottomless pit. Okay. And, and we can attach the Jacobins there. So we can, we can put all of these ideas that, that are beginning at that time. We can say those are going to lead to the French Revolution, but also to the Soviet Revolution, to the Russian Revolution, right? And, and the connection between the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution is pretty clear. Yes, it is. Um, and especially if you know much about Russian history in the in the 1800s, that it's it's really a development um, of what leads to the to the Russian Revolution of within the and, and the one of the crazy things is that um, where does the the idea of where does the Russian Revolution happen? Like who dreams up the idea of the Russian Revolution? Not that we're all experts on the Russian Revolution. I'm definitely not. I've studied it, but. Just in a general sense, does it come from the grassroots up or does it start with a, which class of people is going to start the Russian Revolution? What, what would we classify them as? Where, where does it start? Where does the seeds of it happen? Is it going to be farmers who are going to start the Russian Revolution? I mean, they're going to be involved later on. But is it, is it farmers who start thinking about governments and that they're oppressed and that they... You know, they should be, uh, you know, sharing things and so forth. I, is, thought, is it, that, I thought it was a labor union. Okay. okay, they're going to be instruments later they on. Call, I think they call the, the the intelligentsia, so they're like the scholars, people that like to throw around theories. Okay, it's going to be the intellectual class, right, That that's going to really start these ideas. People in colleges, right? It's not going to be farmers who are going to be thinking about overthrowing the government. It, it's going to be an intellectual class. Now, eventually, they're going to have, they're going to be able to turn the populace against the government, right? Against the monarchy. So these ideas were developing in Russia because of the French Revolution. 
the Russians really admired the French. And so when you look at the upper classes in Russia, they're the ones that are actually going to end up causing the Russian revolution. And many of them are going to be killed, right? Do people understand where I'm getting, where I'm going with this? Not yet. Okay. So, I mean, if we look, look at it today, you know, what has happened? We have, we have this group of people, whatever you want to label them as, uh, but they have these ideas that they don't understand the results of where those ideas will lead, right? They're very impractical. If you look at like the World Economic Forum, you know, what they believe. If the revolution occurs that they would want, do you think that they would survive? Has it ever happened in history that the people who who think this is such a wonderful idea, not, not necessarily the heads of that, but, you know, the people who end up supporting these ideas, it's, it's going to turn out bad for them, right? Because they, they, they ignore history. Those that, you know, ignore history are doomed to repeat it. If all these people who want to communism, they want to have Sorry. communism or socialism in, in the United States, would that turn out well for them? No. No. Of course right. not. They're going to be slaughtered. I mean, Robespierre was slaughtered at the end of all this horrible right. terror. It, it's, it's what it's just all one these happens, right? So, um, so anyway, you know, we have this this class of people that in in the French Revolution, the people who support the revolution are mostly going to be slaughtered, right? Like, right? They're they're going to end up turning on on each other. Right. You, you understand what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not going into detail here. All. But but we know that that there are people who support a revolution, but they end up getting their heads taken off. Right. Right. And, and it's always that way. The people don't realize that when they bring about this disorder, that they think they're going to bring about something better. But all that ends up happening is a bunch of people die. Well, this is how Satan, Satan operates, though. He uses people for his own ends, and then he has them slain. Okay. So when we deal with this satanic power, maybe what we should see is that this satanic power has to do with destruction, right? When we look at Islam, it it's, comes out of the bottomless pit, and it's destructive, right? The one that has the key of the bottomless pit that is Othman, He's also called uh, Apollyon and Abad, Abaddon, right? Which is referring to destruction. So can we say that that's really what this coming out of the bottomless pit has to do with? It's satanic destruction. And that at the end of time, we're going to have the beast also ascend out of the bottomless pit again. Like, well, not the beast again, but a beast ascend out of it, which is this time a different beast. It's not going to be revolutionary France. It's going to be well, something, right? So the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, we need to define what that beast is in Revelation 17. It's not the woman who's riding the beast. Hey, Stephen, you have some thoughts on this? Well, I think we can associate it with destruction. Um, but then the beast... Well, the papacy during the 1260, you could say as well, was quite destructive. But not in the mm -hmm. same way. I mean, you have to admit, the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution, way more people died in a short period of time than during the time of the papacy. You know, if you look at the spans of time involved. Mm -hmm. um, well, I suppose it did take a time for the papacy to get going. But around the 1200s, it was... Uh, yeah, but you're still, like the, the, you had the Cathars, the Albigenses. Yeah, and... yeah. but still, it, it's not the type of slaughter that we had in such a short period of time that you had in both the French and Russian revolutions. Like, a lot of people died under the papacy, but that's over years and years and years, even in the times of highest persecution. I mean, in France, you had that guillotine going, or the guillotine going, you know, Pretty much nonstop for for 
short periods of time, but a lot of people dying in a short period of time. And we expect that type of thing to happen again. Well, yeah, we know, we do understand there's going to be a large amount of destruction in a short period of time while it occurred over a long period previously in the 1260. Okay. So then we also have Revelation 17, verse 11. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Now, we are told, right, the beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. So we obviously know that's the same beast. So the beast that uh, ascends out of the bottomless pit, he is also the eighth, right, of, of the these seven kings. Now, now he's not the eighth king, right? He's the eighth, but he's not the eighth king. Do you agree with me there? Because how many kings are there that are listed? There are so seven, seven kings. Seven kings. So the eighth isn't one of the kings, but he is the eighth, right? Because he's a resurrection of something, okay? And and he was and is not, and he is of the seven. Doesn't mean he's one of the seven that the seven are the ones who bring him, that is, he comes into power because of the seven. And, and, and I take that as the United States making an image to the beast. So they, they put the, the papacy, this beast that was and is not. But um, and, and so that has to be the, pa- the papacy. But it's a beast. And it's not the woman, right? Right? When he's going to explain the woman the mystery of the woman and of the beast that she rides, right? He's going to say, the beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, shall go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. And here's a mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, mountains on which the woman sitteth. So we're saying that this is wrong, Right. So that means the woman is sitting upon these seven heads and seven mountains. Those seven heads are the heads of this beast, the scarlet colored beast. Okay. But we know that the beast that thou sawest was and is not is going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. And so, so the nations of the world are going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. So we had Islam first be the first one that descends out of the bottomless pit. Atheistic France ascends out of the bottomless pit. But now this scarlet colored beast, you know, is going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. So when we said the eighth, you know, is, is uh, the papacy, right? Right. But it says the eighth is the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. So it's either the beast of Revelation 13 that ascends out of the bottomless pit, or it's the beast of Revelation 17 that ascends out of the bottomless pit. But it's the beast that was and is not, and yet is. Hopefully people see the problem, that we have a puzzle here that we have to fit together. And and I don't think, at least in my mind, I haven't fit it all. Fit. I don't have a, a good fit for everything yet. Because the woman is going to ride this beast, Right. If, if it's the beast of Revelation 17 and if it's the beast of Revelation 17 that ascends out of the bottomless pit, maybe what we can say is that the beast of Revelation 13, that these characteristics, the seven heads and ten horns, we have them in pagan Rome, we have them in paper Rome. But we have the kingdoms of the world at the end with seven heads and ten horns. And, and we take. So the way that I've taken it, the way that I understand it, seven heads represent the United States, the ten horns represent the UN, and the woman represents the papacy. So are we just simply saying that the kingdoms of the world, which is represented by the United Nations and the United States, are going to ascend out of the bottomless pit? That has nothing to do with atheism per se. Right, because the United States is not atheistic; it's a Protestant nation. But we're going to say that it's the eighth. This, this, so, so that fits in with what we understand about the Sunday Law, because we're saying this eighth is a symbol dealing with uh, the Sunday Law. Right? You understand what I'm saying? Hopefully, people are following me uh, 
thinking through this out loud. Mm-hmm. William, you have a comment? Yeah, I was going to ask it. Okay, if this if the Scarlet Beast is not the woman, right? Well, no, it can't be because she's riding. Okay, okay. then you you just got saying the United States was a seven, seven, and a ten is a um, UN, UN, right? Yeah. So you saying that the papacy is riding the Scarlet? You saying that the United States in the paper in a ten horns, which is the UN. Is a scarlet colored beast. Yeah. So, so right. So the 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 scarlet colored beast represents the kingdoms of the world, which right. contain the seven heads of the United States and the ten horns of the UN. Right. Okay. Now. Okay, and she's riding the she's riding that scarlet colored beast. Yeah, okay. at the end of the world. Right now, she, which we she, are in the end of the world, right? But she's she's ridden it the whole time. She's been riding a beast. She's been committing fornication with the kingdoms of the of the earth for the twelve sixty as well. But here specifically at the end of time. So she's in the city of Rome, but specifically at the end of time, this beast is going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. It's either the beast of Revelation seventeen that was and is not and yet is, and that shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition and so forth. Or it's the beast of Revelation 13, or maybe in some ways it's just, you know, if it's the beast of Revelation 13, then we attach the papacy to it, which is what I was doing before. I was saying, well, it's the beast of Revelation 13 that was and is not, because it's the one that receives the the deadly wound, right? That beast, one of the heads does, and that head being the papacy. Okay. But yeah, it's it's um, I, so I think you know my thinking was was wrong. I think that what we have to say here is that the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit is this characteristic of these seven heads and ten horns. So these these exist with pagan Rome, they exist with papal Rome, and they exist with in our time the seven heads and the ten horns. They're not the same thing in each time period, but this beast has the same form as a symbol that represents the kingdoms of the world. They change in their structure, right? So when we deal with the kingdoms of the world with the great red dragon, which is primarily a symbol of Satan, but in a secondary sense, it's going to be uh, pagan Rome, Ellen White says. And we see, well, the seven heads aren't going to be, you know, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, etc. Those are going to be the seven forms of Roman government. And the ten horns are going to be those ten kings uh, dealing with that period from the time of, uh, you know, when they become the imperial Rome until uh, basically the destruction of Jerusalem, right? So you're going to have that period of time being marked out. However, we want to number those ten kings. But it's that period of time. And then when we get to Revelation 13, again, we, we have these seven heads and ten horns, but they're definitely different. The beast is different. It's a composite beast. It has all the characteristics of Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. Plus, it has seven heads and ten horns, but the seven heads can't be the same thing. They can't be the forms of Roman government. And the ten, ten horns here would represent uh, the ten kingdoms or divisions of Europe. Right. So they couldn't be, you know, the 10 imperial Roman emperors because we're not in the time of pagan Rome. We're in the time of papal Rome. That's going to be during the 1260. Right. And we now see that pagan Rome persecutes the woman. She flees into the wilderness. Right. To be nurtured for 1260 years. But it's the papacy, the, the beast of Revelation 13, that's going to be ruling during that time at the end of their period. The United States is going to arise. So Ellen White talks about, you know, different nations arising. She talks about the United States arising in 1798. And she talks about France arising, dealing with the execution of Louis XVI in 1793, right? Right. So so we have two different nations arising at that time. Now, we've taken the position that 
when it comes to the seven heads, you have Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, then the United States rising in 1798. Now, France arises in 1793, but we don't put France as the sixth head and the United States as the seventh, right? I think I can agree with that. Okay, yeah. So we're going to say the United States arises at the end of the 1260. Now, France arises too, but it's not one of the heads. But we are going to have, uh, at the end, we have the United Nations. The United Nations, in a sense, is an inheritor of a characteristics of France, right? It, one is it, it, it inherits this whole idea of atheism, communism, etc., right? All these different isms that, that we would tie into as spiritualism. Okay, so is, is me talking about this, is this helping people think it through a little bit? And any comments on this? I mean, it's just me thinking out loud. I don't see where, where you could disagree too much. Okay. I just so, with, yeah, the, going into perdition. So that kind of relates to Judas. He was the son of perdition. Yeah. So therefore, would not that beast then be that which Judas typifies? Okay. And what exactly is Judas typifying? Well, he was someone that looked like Christ's disciples, but was um, crucified him in the sense or deceptive. Yeah. So he, he, like making a church, a yeah. sort of church state relationship. Yeah, but he also has a satanic element to him, right? Yes. Okay, so, so we can see that Satan had him. Yes. Um, I was curious. I was curious. Um, with the ten kings arise, the United States will exist, will no longer exist as this nation, right? Well, well, the United States exists because there's going to be a threefold union, right? So you're going to have false prophet, the dragon power, which would be the UN, which is also the ten horns, right? The and false then, prophet is his past, and so the United States, right? And then you have the papacy. Okay. But you can see how, you know, and I've known these problems exist in Revelation 17 for a long time. I mean, I personally have had these problems with Revelation 17, trying to to make sense out of it. And and part of it, you know, I had a, a pastor who was, you know, trying to say we got these seven heads are the seven popes. And, of course, that his prediction has all failed because, you know, um, I guess, you know, Pope Benedict would have had to have been the Antichrist and the Sunday law would have had to come in, in his thinking the next Pope was going to be, uh, you know, the Antichrist. Um, you know, we've already had, you know, since then Francis and we will probably still have another Pope. Francis is getting pretty old, but, uh, you know, there's there's just these problems, these inconsistencies in our interpretations, and we usually just skip over them, right? We have our way of thinking, all of these other little details that don't fit in, we just ignore, and and we we really can't afford to do that. Um, so we we look at it in different ways. We say, well, if this is means this, then how does it affect the other things that we think? Um, so. At this point, I would think the most consistent is to say that the seven heads and ten horns are a characteristic that is consistent as as a uh, a template upon which other in which in other times those things have different symbols. Seven heads can symbolize different things in different times, but there's a reason why there's seven heads, and ten horns can symbolize different things in different periods of time. But there's a reason why they're 10. And the beast itself symbolizes the kingdoms of the world. And then where this beast comes from, whether it comes from a sea or whether it ascends out of the bottomless pit, tells us something about its characteristics and the time in which it is as well. And so the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, we can say the beast that was and is not. So what if we took the position that the beast of Revelation 13, it was for the 1260, it is not for the days of one king, 
the time in the United States, the 70 years, the days of one king, not 70 literal years, but as a symbol. And then it, when it arises again, it arises this time out of the bottomless pit. But it's but remember, it's not just the papacy because the papacy itself at the end of the world is this woman. Now, she, of course, rides this beast all through this history, but she's also the beast of Revelation 13. She's part of it. She's one of the heads. Right. But here at in this in chapter right. seven, and she's shown right. as this woman riding this beast, not as one of the heads. Kate William? But, 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 wouldn't the Protestant churches be a woman as well? Well, they are a woman, but they're not the woman mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Right. Right. Because this is the mother. But they're eventually the, the Protestant church will join hands with the papacy, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So one is we have different symbols at different times to try to tell us something about that time. And so one of the problems that I've had and I think it's a problem that many Adventists have had, is how does the Sunday law come about in a secular world? And we know it's going to be a religious Sunday law, and it's going to be a Christian Sunday law in some ways, right? It's, 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 not, going to be, it's not going to be a labor union Sunday, Sunday law. It's not right. going to be an environmental Sunday law. Now, these, of course, can be initially reasons that that get this thing in people's minds, but people have to, in some way, embrace uh, the reason that this Sunday law is going to come about, and that's because judgments of God upon the nations, right? They're going to be wanting to appease God in some way, right? Responding to God because of what's happening. That's the way I understand the Sunday law progresses. Okay. So any, any thoughts on that? that is that correct? <clears throat> okay, well, let, let's go on and read what he says, where she says, uh, Dwight, do you want to read on? I know we haven't really read much. We just tried to discuss this. In 1793, Louis XVI, the King of France, was removed and executed. In 1798, Pope Pius VI was removed. It must be remembered that the reason France was ruined was due to the fact that clear back in 1535, by a solemn and public ceremony, she had committed herself to the destruction of Protestantism. The papal policy was to withhold the Bible from the people, whereas the Reformation had presented to the world an open Bible. When France rejected the gift of heaven, she sowed the seeds of anarchy and ruin, and the inevitable outworking of cause and effect resulted in the revolution and the reign of terror. Great Controversy 227 to 230. She goes on to let us know that France has made the fatal mistake of calling evil good and good evil, with the result that they thought they were doing God's service in persecuting and killing his people. So in other words, he's he's reaching backwards in his support of this of this point, going back to the the time when the papists chose to slaughter many of the French by using and and allowing the king to do the work for them. Right. So so they have um well, because you know, I come from Huguenot ancestors, partly mostly English, but perhaps some French. And and so the Huguenots that were chased out of France, this is sort of a precursor to what happens with the French Revolution itself, right? So the Huguenots are going to be earlier. But this basically, it just turns upon the church. So what happened, what they did is going to happen to them. Right. Now, it's, it's interesting because of this this ceremony because this was occurring i believe 21st of january of 1535 wasn't it i don't know i don't know that date but i know that the huguenots are going to be um in that period of time just prior to uh like they're going to start prior to this event or around that time they're connected 
because you got the St. Bartholomew Day Massacre in 1572, the Huguenot community made up as much as 10% of the French population. By 1600, it had declined to 7.8% and reduced further late in the century after the return of persecution under Louis XIV. Well, I'm just reading here, but... um, so in that period of time, you're going to have, yeah, they're going to be trying to deal with Protestantism in France, which is going to be the Huguenot. Well, what, what I'm getting at is this, in this particular situation that happened in 1535, 258 years to the day later, you have Louis XVI being executed. Okay. Okay, so you got, um, so where do you get that date? So the date that they're going to have this solemn and public ceremony is in, what? what's the date in 1535? January 21st. Okay, right. Yeah, we talked about that in, in later on with Louis. Yeah, yeah, I should have remembered Louis the 16th. Um, so that's going to be the Julian calendar, right? Well, I would I would agree that would have to be the Julian calendar. And then by 1793, have they gone then to the Gregorian calendar? Yeah. So. Yeah. So that's going to be. But anyway, it's, it's yeah. I mean, the symbol is still there. January 21st and uh, the 158 years. 258. 258. Yes. Yeah. 258. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's 258 years. Okay. Go on, Dwight. Okay. I'm I'm looking at something real quick. Now, so here where it talks about they were doing God's service and persecuting and killing his people, I don't think that that's what they thought because they didn't believe in God. I mean, unless you're talking about the, you know, the Catholics obviously killing the Protestants. Right. But when you're dealing with here, like the reign of terror, they're not trying to do God any service. They're just um, killing people because they want to have freedom. You know, they bought into the lie. So, so here where it says the prophetic role of the nation of France was twofold to allow for the rise of atheism and to terminate the 1260 year time period of papal supremacy. These two things resulted in the removal of the papacy as the fifth kingdom and set stage for the rise of the sixth kingdom, that of the United States of America. Though France is the power that actually and literally terminated the temporal or temporal power of the papacy in 1798, atheism was the operative ideology. The fact that atheism is portrayed as a beast requires that it be attached to some form of earthly government. In this case, it was the government of France. So he argues that, well, it's the government of France that's the beast, but but that this is actually atheism, which doesn't make sense. So he's he's sort of not being very clear here. Because if he had just said the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit was France or atheistic France, I, I wouldn't have had any problem with that. Right. But to argue that it's atheism. Yeah, and then he brings up here... It's interesting to note, however, that it is God who ultimately sets the boundaries for a nation. Not really sure why, however, is in there. And what particularly this has to do with his argument. So he's not really quite clear. So he's going to say, I'm just going to skip that because we're familiar with that verse. But he says, the one power, the papal power, produced the other power, that of atheism. And both of them together engaged in a war against God in the Bible. And I don't think both of them together engaged in a war against God in the Bible. Right. Right. So he tries to say because they had the same, they did the same thing that they were united in doing that. These two powers working in tandem, they don't work in tandem. It's all, it's almost like the, the thought process is that they're going about this hand in hand, which they are not. Right. They're definitely not. They're enemies of each other. That they have a common enemy doesn't even mean that they work together. Right. Right. In in that common enemy. And and also they're enemies of each other. I mean, 
I don't think the the papacy was uh, working hand in hand with uh, atheistic, you know, with the French Revolution to kill off all their clergy. Okay, well, hopefully, you know, we, we got that sorted out a little bit more. But um, this idea that he has regarding atheism. So, I mean, he's not really clear in how he's putting together these arguments. And he spends a lot of time trying to show things that he doesn't seem very clear about himself. I mean, he's, it's like me rambling. Uh, you know, it, in a sense, it's almost like he's trying to think out loud, but he hasn't really thought it through yet. And he never really gets a good conclusion. He's going to bring up education again. Anyway, I guess we'll come back to this tomorrow. And Right. Because this this would begin the the fifth of eight pages. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, any other comments or thoughts of what we've covered today? Shall we then close with a word of prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for all that you are doing in our lives. We ask now, Father, for your watch, care, and guidance, so that we may go forward to do that that you would have us to do today. We ask. Father, for your blessing upon our plans, and if these are not the items, if these are not the things that you would have us to do, then do with us as necessary so that we may glorify your character and your name. Help us to this end. Direct us, we pray. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.